Zelda Ocarina of Time has been out for 25 years, and somehow speedrunners are still finding new ways to break the game with new glitches. This time, a new discovery just happened to obsolete the entire route of the game's most competitive speedrun category, a route that stood strong for nearly 12 years. And the best part was it kinda happened by accident. But before we get to that, let me give you a rundown on why this is a huge deal. Since April 2012, the Defeat Ganon No SRM speedrun, formerly any percent until 2020, was based around a glitch that you're all likely familiar with, the Wrong Warp. Specifically, the one that warps you from the end of Deku Tree all the way to the Ganon's Tower Collapse sequence at the end of the game. This Wrong Warp variation is known as Ganondor. Although new strategies and rerouting would develop over this 12-year period, the foundation for the Ganondor route largely remained the same. Get a bottle to catch bugs in, defeat Goma at the end of the Deku Tree, re-catch the bugs in the bottle, use the bottle in Link's hand to activate the Ocarina Items glitch to escape the blue warp, then exit through the door you came from on the same frame the blue warp fully teleports Link away, and BAM! Link successfully wrong warps into the collapse sequence, where you'd then escape and then defeat Ganon to finish the run. This route was many people's introduction to Ocarina of Time speedrunning, myself included. But as of January 2024, the era of Ganondor has come to a close. Welcome to the era of Ganon Floor. Ganon Floor is a completely new type of wrong warp that is currently used to reach the end of Ganon's tower collapse section from Dodongo's Cavern, the second dungeon in the game. It is unlike any traditional wrong warp method up to this point, and if we take a look at it in action, it looks so fake, like a splice out of a cheated run. But rest assured, it's real, and it has quite the fascinating backstory. On December 1st, 2017, veteran Ocarina of Time speedrunner and community admin Danny B documented some strange behavior in Dodongo's Cavern. He was messing around with a glitch known as Room Duplication, with certain cheats enabled to assist with testing. Room Duplication is a glitch discovered all the way back in July 2009 by glitches and stuff. Normally, only one room or a section of a map can be fully loaded at a time, including textures, actors, and collision. However, if you hover or clip out of bounds into an adjacent unloaded room, the room you came from will still be loaded, and if you cross the loading plane that separated the rooms from the unloaded side, you will clone the loaded room's data, including actors. This has also been shown in other scenarios to duplicate heart pieces and gold sculptulas, for example. In Danny's video, the continuous cloning of the main room of Dodongo's cavern led to something strange. A lot of the collision in the room straight up disappeared. This included walls, solid ground, and ultimately where the video ended. The wooden bridge that runs across the room above the giant Dodongo skull. Upon touching a seemingly unloaded piece of collision close to the bridge, the game crashed. Despite finding a way to recreate this oddity, this video would remain as an obscure, seemingly irrelevant unsolved mystery for the next six years. This swiftly changed on January 18th, 2024, when a notable glitch hunter, Natalia Has Died, revealed that he had been looking into Danny's old video, and made some key observations on why the collision was disappearing. Obviously, cloning the main room had something to do with it, but what exactly happened here? The answer is related to dynamic polygons, or Dynapolys for short. Dynamic polygons are pieces of solid collision that are attached to an actor, such as moving elevators, armo statues, or treasure chests, as opposed to static polygons, which make up the unchanging environment. When the main room was being cloned, so were the Dynapolys. This continuous cloning led to Dynapoly data leaking into other parts of memory, which in turn, corrupted static polys in the room, causing them to seemingly vanish. Of course, such corruption could potentially do more than just delete collision. It could change other properties of the collision as well, like transforming a polygon into a loading zone. 
Nat hypothesized that if you could somehow create a corruption where the position data of a Donapoly's vertex could overflow on top of a specific pocket of code of another polygon, you could feasibly create a loading zone to an exit that is listed within that map scene. Coincidentally, thanks to Mr. Cheese's research on scene exits, Dodongo's cavern was documented to have a tower collapse room as an exit. I think you can see where this is going. What if you could create a loading zone in Dodongo's cavern to Ganon's tower collapse? This was a neat theory and all, but that's all it was. With no current ideas on how to proceed, Nat began to brainstorm possibilities, although he was a bit stumped. But not for long. Not long after Nat posted his and Mr. Cheese's findings, Danny B went to mess around with Dynapoly corruption using GZ, the practice ROM developed by Glank that features tools for practice and for glitch hunting. Just three minutes in, he lucked into making a loading zone on the bridge after duping the room three times. This particular loading zone had a fade to white, but led to an entrance that just crashed the game. The first time Danny got this loading zone was off camera, but he managed to recreate it on video, which further fueled the investigation. Danny then continued to test this exact scenario, this time with certain memory watches enabled to assist Nat and Mr. Cheese in determining what entrance this loading zone took him to before crashing. Just take a wild guess where this is supposed to lead. Good ol' entrance 6733. Where does it go? If you guessed Ganon's tower collapse at the bridge right before the end, you were correct. Unfortunately, the game crashing before the collapse loads was going to be a major obstacle as everyone worked to diagnose the cause. In the video where Danny tested this scenario, he was Child Link and it had become night in game, which does affect some scene setups for a trick like this. So he decided to try again, but this time during daytime. And then this happened. In a different timeline, Nat and Cheese, being the incredibly knowledgeable and intelligent glitch hunters that they are, would have eventually found this themselves. But on that day, Danny B was blessed with such good fortune that it made their jobs much, much easier. Dynapoly corruption wrong warping had been discovered, and with it proven to allow for a wrong warp to the end of the collapse, it was now time for the community to band together and create a new Defeat Ganon route. Over the span of two days, several members of the OOT community came together and worked tirelessly to make Ganon Floor viable for runs. So, what do Defeat Ganon speedruns entail now? Let's go over the route. Time begins on Link's initial movement inside his house, where upon exiting, we make our way back towards the rock circle next to Mido's house. This is the fastest way to grab the blue rupee behind Mido's house. We then jump across these platforms and then this path over the puddle for an additional 10 rupees before entering the shop. There, we collect the hidden blue rupee to the side. We then buy two Deku sticks with the 20 rupees we collected. These are going to be very important since the Kokiri Sword is not part of this route. We then head to Lost Woods over to the pond that has an underwater shortcut to Zora's River, which normally requires the Silver Scale upgrade obtained in Zora's Domain to access. However, we can access the shortcut using a glitch to escape the forest without having to clear the Deku Tree. There are a few ways to access this shortcut early, including the incredibly easy Navi Dive, but we actually don't want to do that. Instead, we do the Navilus method where with a quick setup, you could clip into the corner to hit the loading zone. Once Link enters Zora's river, we're officially in a race against the sun, as the in-game time will progress outside of towns. It is crucial that we make it to Dodongo's cavern before it turns nighttime. We quickly swim down Zora's river to Hyrule Field. Here, we need to make use of one of our sticks to perform a water-extended super slide. By jump slashing against a specific part of this wall at the correct angle, and then hold the smallest possible right input on the analog stick, we can perform a WES. This is known as ESS position, and it is not only useful for performing extended super slides like this, 
but also for making micro adjustments to Link's angle when setting up for certain tricks, as you'll soon see. Wessing the Kakariko is not only crucial for making it to Dodongo's on time, but it also skips the owl cutscene in front of Kakariko. Kakariko Village leads to Death Mountain Trail, where the entrance to Dodongo's cavern is located early on. However, there are a couple of obstacles in our path. The gate to Death Mountain is closed, and it is normally opened by obtaining a letter from Princess Zelda and showing it to the guard. Past the gate on Death Mountain Trail is the entrance to Dodongo's cavern, blocked off by a giant boulder. This boulder can be destroyed with any explosive, and normally, you'd use a nearby bomb flower to blow up the rock, which requires the Goron Bracelet, which requires you to learn Zelda's lullaby, Saria Song, and to have an ocarina in order to access. Getting all these prerequisite items is more than a bit slow, so this is what the speedrun does instead. After waiting 30 seconds, Navi will be able to be called with C up, and using the Navi Dive trick, we can enter the well very early. This is also why you can't do the Navi Dive earlier to escape the forest, since unless you die and respawn, Navi will only reappear after 19 minutes once called. Now that we're in bottom of the well, we need to obtain two items, bomb chews and a deku shield. For several years across various categories, looting chews from the well has been the fastest method to obtain explosives early. It isn't very straightforward though, as the chest containing 10 bomb chews is blocked off by rubble, normally requiring explosives to clear. Of course, since this is Ocarina of Time, you can completely bypass this hurdle. There have been a lot of different strategies used throughout the years, and some of them are exclusive to earlier versions of Ocarina of Time, but for this route, we need to use the Wii Virtual Console release, and the fastest method for early bomb chews on this version is Skull Push. By doing an incredibly precise setup involving many pause-buffered, frame-perfect inputs, where you have to make adjustments based on certain visual cues, you can hit the Skulltula at the start of the Well Mini Dungeon with a stick, and then kill it at just the right time. Then, you backwalk between a wall and the Skulltula corpse before it disappears so Link can clip out of bounds. Once out of bounds, you carefully swim back inbounds to access this chest containing the chews. After that, we can grab a small key from a chest behind a fake wall and use it to unlock this side room and grab a shield from this chest. Alternatively, you can do it the hard way by performing a vine clip using bomb chews right after getting them and then swimming out of bounds to the room with the shield to save 15 seconds. Either way, now that we have the Chews and a Deku Shield, it's time to leave. Back in Kakariko, we can use a trick called Lunge Storage to increase the distance from a Jump Slash with a stick to clip past the gate to Death Mountain. Or, if you're an expert, you can use a Chew to do a Hyper Extended Super Slide from the well and past the gate. Afterwards, we rush to Dodongo's Cavern before it turns night. Once inside, we blow up the mud wall with a chew and then head into the main room. Here, we do a setup to get out of bounds so we can clone the main room. We set up the infinite sword glitch off of the Beemos, which prevents Link from falling off of edges. This property, plus the ability to have a grounded state when shielding damage mid-air from an explosion, allows for bomb hovering, which we need to do to get into position. After getting ISG, we mega flip off of the Beemos' beam to clip out of bounds. Next is a tricky part. Some precise twisted hovers with the chews to reach behind a pillar, and then a mega flip off of another Beemos to get into the nearby unloaded room behind the loading plane from the main room. Now that Link is there, we side hop between the load plane three times to clone the main room. Then, on a specific green frame, we walk back in bounds. In order for this to work, we need to chain two frame-perfect pauses back to back, since those pauses will manipulate memory in just the right way for the wrong warp to work. We can tell what values will be set in memory based on the set of pixels we see on screen when pausing, and thankfully, they are consecutive. If done correctly, boom, Ganon floor. From here, you just beat Ganon, and the run is over. Overall, this new route saves over a minute when compared to the most recent Ganondor route, but it is definitely a lot harder. 
Yet, the tricks required are more valuable to learn for those wishing to be a more well-rounded runner. While the old route kinda had strats mostly exclusive to just defeat Ganon, this new route features Skull Push, Lunge Storage, Hovering, and Hessing. These are tricks that are transferable and relevant to several other categories, even if they have a steep learning curve. The previous defeat Ganon record set in May 2023 was 1257 by Lazutes, arguably the strongest record in the game with zero major mistakes using all the top level strats, and probably would have stood for much longer had Ganon Floor not happened. Once this route had been finalized on January 21st, it wouldn't take long for the record to fall. On that day, many of the game's best runners would trade the record, Count LG, Real Time Attack 64, TKC, and of course, Lazutes himself. As of the writing of this video, he currently has the record of 1147, and with such a new unoptimized route, we can expect this time to fall much lower over the course of the year. Special thanks to Danny B for proofreading my research and script, and CD for editing this video. Learning this run has been quite the task for me, but I can't wait to stream some runs soon. Stay tuned, subscribe if you want to see more speedrun content like this, and thank you for watching.